Look who's on the line this morning. An author, an award-winning civil rights attorney, a talk show host, commentator, go-to expert on legal, political, women's, children's, and celebrity issues. And she is also the founder of her own nonprofit organization dealing with the issue of autism. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about a local Shiro attorney, Ariva Martin. Good morning. Good, good morning, Dominique. So glad to be with you this beautiful, beautiful morning. So I'm glad to have you here with me uh, to my attention, a new study uh, that's come out regarding, I guess we'll call it um, systemic racism um, in the spa- in the uh, special needs space. Yeah, yeah. When my son Marty Dominique was diagnosed with autism, it was widely known at that time that black and brown kids in particular were diagnosed two to four years later than their typical peers. And, and there were lots of explanations or, or you know, justifications for that delay. Uh, but they had never really, they being researchers and scientists and experts, had never really uh, officially, you know, called out systemic racism as, as the cause for why we saw this delay. And this recent study that came out at the end of last year, it was done by researchers at UCLA, researchers at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, called out these disparities and, and really gave a name to it. And, and that name is, unfortunately, systemic racism. And, and what they found in, in you know, researching black families who have kids on the spectrum is that there was a three-year delay in getting a diagnosis for black kids. And the, the, you, you'll just be shocked as a black mother yourself. The delay was caused because when black parents, uh, primarily mothers, went to their doctors to uh, alert them about delays that they saw with their children, whether it was, you know, my child isn't talking or, you know, they're not giving me eye contact or not responding to their name, whatever those, uh, you know, issues were that the parent may have brought to the attention of the doctor, they were ignored. They were not believed. They were not acted upon. Wow. Uh, and structurally, black parents are not given credit <laughs> for knowing their children, for knowing, you know, uh, to uh, be able to alert doctors about developmental, you know, the developmental warning signs. And they would get, you know, passed around from, you know, like a game of telephone from one office to the next and really just told to wait, to wait, to wait. Oh, you know, we'll check this out. Don't worry about it. You know, we'll just observe this. And all of that procrastination resulted in a three-year difference. And again, not oh. because the child didn't need the help or the services, but just because the medical system did not believe black parents. That's crazy. That broke my heart. <laughs> it it my- is heartbreaking, especially when, you know, we always hear and read about how black children are disproportionately placed in, uh, you know, special education classrooms. But it sounds like not getting the support uh, and the and the kind of therapeutic help that they might need. Yeah, you're right about that statistic. Black kids are disproportionately identified uh, as special education, and typically that happens when they start to exhibit what for some communities would be considered normal behaviors, but because of the color of their skin, it's labeled as aggressive behavior. So we've seen school districts, you know, take kids who have otherwise normal behaviors, label them as somehow, you know, maladaptive behaviors, and then place those kids in special education services as a way to get them out of general education classrooms. So that is a reality. And then on the flip side, what this study says is there are kids who have legitimate needs who need extra help and support and can't get it because they, you know, the system does not value black parents doesn't value you know see us as intellectually capable uh, you know enough to know what's going on with our own kids and and i actually had a chance uh, on the special report my web-based talk show to interview the researcher involved in this uh, study Mm. 
And what was profound, again, this time around, is one of the, the really uh, well-known and well-respected pediatric journals, other scientists started to comment on the findings of the report and called it out in the journal for the first time, uh, labeled this delay structural racism. So that was huge in the disability community because, you know, we use words like disparities and differences and you know, all these more polite words. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know they went right to the heart of it and called it out as racism. And, you know, we can't fix what we don't admit. So by admitting it, you know, we are on the pathway, hopefully, to fixing it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really, really important that you're, you know, amplifying this conversation because it's two sides of the same double edged sword. I mean, as a parent, you know that you you sound the alarm about something with your child and you are often ignored but at the same time normal behaviors as you say are pathologized and our kids you know end up being body slammed by cops for crying too loud or doing things that w they would be comforted for if they were not black yeah we, we see that all too often and I, what i really want parents to get out of this study is that uh, don't ever relinquish your, 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 your knowledge, your intuition. Uh, trust your intuition. You know your child better than anyone. And as you said, both sides of this coin. So that means if you notice things about your child in terms of their development that you think aren't right, you want to raise the alarm about that. And if you notice your child being, you know, penalized, for behaviors that you know are normal, you also want to raise the alarm about that as well. And and that's is what, that's what Special Needs Network does is we teach parents, uh, you know, how to be advocates. You you often hear people say there there are no manuals that come with being a parent, and we try to change that, particularly as it relates to understanding your rights, uh, understanding the developmental signs, and, and knowing how to uh, be an effective advocate for your child. So we've kind of written a manual for parents that uh, we hope help them navigate some very complex systems. Yeah, and that's, um, that's knowledge that can apply to any parent, really, because we all have to be advocates regardless of what's going on with our kids. And a lot of us are really concerned i know i am about the return to in-person uh school and just the transition and getting our children back to regular life after a year on lockdown i i just think that the the impact of this is something that the mainstream world is not really taking seriously like they they give it lip service but i don't think they really understand how traumatized the children are no, I totally agree with you. And a part of the conference, the Tools for Transformation conference, we have a, a leading uh, psychologist. I mentioned her. Her name is Dr. Alfie Breland Noble. She's uh, in Washington, D.C. And she's a trauma specialist and particularly trauma in the African-American community. And she's going to uh, be the presenter on our mental health workshop because, again, you know, you can't be in the midst of a pandemic and not talk about the mental health issues uh, that uh, you know, we've all experienced, you know, the loneliness, the anxiety, the depression, uh, and our kids have been, you know, uh, really impacted. There are studies that show that, you know, teenagers in particular have really struggled during this pandemic. And so she's going to address, again, knowing those warning signs, knowing what to look for, uh, and then things that you can do to, to, you know, heal yourself as well as how to and when to seek professional help. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, I definitely am going to check it out. It sounds super informative and, you know, just important. I, I'm always marveling at how professionals in, in so many different industries just don't have the training, which probably isn't even their fault, but don't have the training to deal with this growing, um, growing group of people who have special needs. Yeah, and, and like I said, the numbers are staggering. And, and anybody that's sitting at home thinking, hmm, this doesn't involve me. Well, yeah, it probably does. <laughs> because, uh, you know, the, the number of folks, and there are lots of adults, Dominique, who uh, struggle with, you know, learning disabilities, never, ever diagnosed. They're, you know, anxiety disorders, social disorders, you know, uh, behavioral mm. disorders. 
never diagnosed. Uh, so again, something for everyone at this 15th annual Tools for Transformation conference. You know, learn the warning signs, learn the, the resources, you know, learn the supports that are out there uh, that can help you and, and help your family. So that's what we've been doing for the last 15 years. We, because of this wow. pandemic, you know, had to think about how to do it creatively. And, and I, I'm super excited because we've been able to, to broaden the net and reach folks all over this country who are struggling with these issues. Uh, and the beauty is it's free. You don't have to pay any money. <laughs> you don't have to you know, worry about coming out pocket or spending your stimulus check or doing any of that. You know, we have <laughs> the support of generous uh, donors, California uh, Wellness Foundation and uh, Anthem Blue Cross. They are sponsoring this year's conference and uh, helping us make it available to people across this country and particularly here in in California uh, at no cost. That's amazing. Speaking of never diagnosed, Attorney Areva Martin, let's talk about the trauma that a lot of us are experiencing in watching this trial, the Derek Chauvin trial, where we're repeatedly watching the, if we're watching the trial, we're seeing over and over again the killing of George Floyd. I Personally, I do limit how much I watch it. There's a lot of reading that I do because I don't like watching his murder over and over again. I think when I was reading about the trauma, it seems like it could be affecting any of us and we might not even realize why we're feeling out of sorts. Yeah, there there have been a lot of studies done about the trauma that uh, people who aren't even personally, uh, you know, connected to an individual that has lost their life as a result of police violence, particularly the trauma to the African-American community. And it's well documented uh, that watching those murders and in particularly the murder of George Floyd is traumatizing. And there's a debate uh, in the media. There's a debate amongst experts in terms of how those videos should be played and whether they should be played at all. And of course, you can imagine that lawyers and folks like myself who are saying as painful as those videos are to watch, they play an important role uh, in terms of us holding police officers accountable and, you know, pushing for changes in the uh, criminal justice system. Uh, But I've talked to a lot of psychologists and they recommend exactly what you're doing, which is if you don't have to watch that video for a living, i.e. you don't work in the media, you're not involved somehow in this trial, uh, they are recommending that people really limit the amount of time they spend watching the trial, that they, you know, find a trusted source. They check in with that source, you know, once a day, or once a couple of times a week. And, and that's it, because the impact of watching not only the, the killing of George Floyd, now we've had to watch those bystanders. We've had to watch nine year olds and 17 year olds yeah. and 61 year olds. Right. Uh, who were at the scene, who were eyewitnesses. Now we've gotten to know them. We've gotten to listen to their testimony. And we've watched them struggle emotionally and psychologically. So uh, there, there's so many layers of trauma. And, and let's talk about what's about to happen in this trial. I, I am uh, doing trial coverage for uh, HLN and CNN, which you know, I've been a legal analyst for them for several years. And one of the phases... Uh, of the trial that we're moving into, it, it's the uh, addiction, Mr. Floyd's uh, off and on addiction to uh, drugs. And the defense is starting to introduce that evidence of his drug addiction. And it's going to get pretty ugly. Uh, and it's going to be painful for a lot of people in our community to listen to the testimony about his drug addiction and some of the conduct that he. Uh, engaged in as a result of that drug addiction. So I, I just caution people who, uh, you know, may not be aware. But uh, unfortunately, these types of trials often end up putting the victim, in this case, Mr. Floyd, uh, you start to feel like the victim is on trial. Uh, in this case, it's, it's going to be no different. A lot of that's going to happen, and we're moving into it today and over the next couple of days. Yeah, it's it's really disturbing when that happens. And I understand, as another attorney pointed out to me, this is just the defense doing their job. But I feel, well, most of us feel, we've seen it happen from Trayvon Martin to Rodney King, where the 
where the victim is demonized and we don't seem to see the same kind of character assassination of the perpetrator or the suspect uh, I, you know rarely do we even hear them called suspects um, you know officers who kill I think this trial has been different a little bit because you see so many police officers who seem to disagree with what uh, Derek Chauvin did but still um, overall it's just it, and I, I think the whole trauma conversation is really important because we might be suffering from this and not even realize it you know if you're feeling a lack of energy or you're feeling you know depressed or anxious or whatever you might just think you're having a bad day and then maybe don't connect it to the fact that you've been consuming a lot of this trial um, so I think that's one reason why it's important especially for black people because from from what I'm reading and what I'm feeling in my gut, it is harder for us. And we also know, Dominique, that there is no guarantee that there's going to be a conviction yeah. in this case. I think a lot of us are, are walking around with that that sense that here we go again. We watched Rodney King get beaten to a pulp on video. We saw with our own eyes and then we watched those cops get acquitted in that first trial and then have you know having to they had to be retried in a federal court uh before there was some conviction so and we've watched since that time period officers not be charged at all officers charged who but were later acquitted so we know that the outcome in this case isn't necessarily what we think it should be based on what we witnessed in that nine minute 29 second videotape so there's also that i think in the back of our minds that this could be yet another opportunity for the defense to find that one juror and, and let me just say for those folks who are wondering you know how could this not be a slam dunk it absolutely positively is not a slam dunk uh, in our judicial system all 12 of those jurors have to reach a unanimous decision on either the second degree third degree or manslaughter charges and if there is one juror who decides that, you know, when you don't do exactly what a cop tells you to do, you get everything that comes to you after that point. If there's one juror that believes that and buys into the defense's demonization of George Floyd, which is if you do drugs, what happens to you is, you know, what happens to you, that person could be a holdout and we could end up with what's called a hung jury, which means that there's no conviction and then the prosecution is back in the position of deciding do we try Derek Chauvin again and, and go through this whole grueling emotional process uh, you know over again so and a lot of what the defense when that lawyer told you the defense is just doing their job yes but you know our, our system allows this to happen and as we talk about criminal justice reform we have to think about the standards that the prosecution has to meet in terms of holding a police officer accountable because it's different than the standards that apply to you and me and everyday citizens. Uh, and that dog whistle racism, that, that dog whistle, you know, playing on those old tired racist tropes of the superhuman black man and the down and out, you know, drug addict uh, with the hopes of, you know, connecting with one juror who harbors some of those racist beliefs and feelings is really, uh, I think, long past due. And we need to figure out how to make these trials uh, not easier, but definitely uh, more equitable. Yeah, more fair. I mean, I think, yeah. the, you know, the passing the Breathe Act or the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act would help because some of the things would be more clearly illegal. Some of the things that were done, um, you know, by Derek Chauvin would be more clearly illegal. Um, but certainly you know more about it than I do about how it's baked into the justice system. Do you think that this situation with this trial will be worse if, there is an acquittal because of the marching that we did, you know, last year and because people are starting to feel like more people are waking up to this uh, reality of, of systemic racism and, and the dual justice systems, separate but unequal justice system for black people. I mean, it, it, do you think it would be harder for people? 
Well, I can tell you that that is the thinking amongst law enforcement uh, agencies and amongst, you know, local elected officials uh, that it's not going to just be Minneapolis that may be ablaze if there is not a conviction, but cities around this country. And primarily because you know, this is the first time that we've witnessed not just someone who gets killed by the police with our very eyes, but we are witnessing the entire process from him walking into that store, Cup Foods. We, we saw him walk in uh, a happy-go-lucky everyday person and nine, ten minutes later, you know, have the life squeezed out of him because three men decided to, you know, use their body weight to hold him down, even though he was handcuffed and in a prone position and not resisting. Uh, and I, I think the response to, to a non-conviction in this case could have repercussions, uh, you know, that are felt around the country. And unfortunately, that could include violence on the streets uh, in many cities in this country. We're talking with attorney Ariva Martin. You can get in on the conversation, 520-KJLH, 520-5554 with your questions and comments. It's the front page, Radio Free, 102.3 KJLH. Being joined now by attorney Ariva Martin. Wish we had more time. Attorney Martin, we got a bunch of people now trying to ask you questions. So let's turn <laughs> to the phones, if you don't mind. Yep. Sounds good. Going to P-Dub, calling us from Pasadena. Hey, good morning. Can you morning. hear me okay? I do. Good morning. Okay, great. Uh, first, my statement. Uh, we're finding out in this age of information that this country is fortified and built on lies. It always has been. Especially when you can watch television and seeing this guy get murdered over and over and over again. And you have news media like uh, Fox News saying it isn't what you really see. And people, it, it, they're so confused. That's why I won't even take the coronavirus, I mean, uh, vaccine. Okay, so it's 552. What's your bottom Wait. line, P-Dub? Bottom line is 
You can't believe anything. And uh, racism is a disease of America. It's, it's a cancer for America. We've got to get rid of racism before we go forward. Yeah, working on that. All right, P-Dub. Attorney Ariva Martin, P-Dub, saying, can't believe anything you see on TV. Well, you're on TV. What do you say about that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a big, broad blanket statement. I understand the distrust uh, in the media because you're right. You can turn on the station and, and, you know, you could hear anchors and, you know, commentators telling you that what you saw in that videotape is not what you should believe. Uh, What you have to do, sir, is find a trusted source of information and rely on that trusted source because there are still lots of us in the media who will give it to you straight uh no chaser so don't give up on us yeah and p-dub call back call me back let's talk about that uh your statement about the vaccines because i think you know we just we have to find like you say trusted sources and compare different um different opinions going to saha from inglewood good morning saha good morning can you hear me yep what's on your mind Okay, my my point I want to make is why is it that uh, officers or law enforcement can hide all the facts and the history of their all their all their um, wrongdoings, and then when something comes up uh, that big that they are caught doing, and they don't even have to reveal, or they can hide all their sources of of all the long doing doings that the, for any particular like officer. why can officers hide their history of racism their history yeah, of yeah. Um, and they don't never ever discuss that talk yeah. about Sheldon didn't have it that record that's a, you know that's baloney because they, they do that all the time they right. probably he's used to killing people like that okay let's have attorney martin address what you just yes. said i mean Sheldon is a great that's example a great because question. he has a lot of priors yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So let's let's be clear. There's a court of public opinion and there's a court of law. Very different. There are rules of evidence that uh, apply in a courtroom that don't apply when we're just, you know, talking about these cases in the media. And in a court, the thinking is that someone's past behavior is not, you know, an indicator of what their current behavior. So courts are reluctant to allow your past wrongdoings, your past conduct to come into a trial because they don't want jurors looking at that past conduct saying, well, if you did it before, you probably did it this time. But in this trial, even though Chauvin had 18 complaints filed against him, uh, there will be testimony regarding two uh, of those allegations of excessive force, two that the judge determined were similar in nature to uh, the the case that Chauvin is being tri- tried for now. So you will hear about two instances where the prosecution said he used excessive force. They both involve him uh, kneeling and, and using a, a chokehold on citizens. So you will hear about two. those incidents even though we know there are many many more it seems like they're always bringing in the victims past though well again the victims past should not in a trial be used to attack the character of that victim because again the victim is not on trial in this case the judge allowed uh 2019 uh arrest of George Floyd to come in under the theory that how he responded in that situation is similar or could be viewed as similar to how he responded in this case. And the incident involved uh, police pointing a gun at him, telling him he was under arrest and him uh, apparently taking some pills uh, and the paramedics having to be called to the scene. His blood pressure was up really high. Paramedics told him, look, you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke if you don't get to a hospital. And the defense wants to use that 2019 incident to show that when confronted with police, that uh, Mr. Floyd would swallow drugs as a way to end up at a hospital rather than going to jail and being arrested. So we'll see what impact that has on the jury. We know drug use is going to come into this case because the defense's argument is that Uh, It wasn't the kneeling on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds that killed him, but rather it was a drug overdose combined with pre-existing heart conditions. Right. And and pre-existing blackness, because they could I mean, to me, that's just ridiculous. You might as well just say, well, he's a black man. Black men die in America. So that's why he died. Um, That's not a legal argument, but that's how ridiculous (laughs) this seems to me. Going to George calling us from L.A. 
Hi, George. Good morning, Dominic. How you doing? Good, good. Morning. good. What's you on your mind? I just want, I want our, our young people to know. Uh, they can come up with some new ideas. I want them to understand that we've been living in this for over 100 years. Don't don't get delusional. I want you to be, be vigilant. Understand the child going on. I believe within my heart 